Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. Welcome back to the show, and welcome back to the show, Dr. M. David Lipa. Good to see you again. Thank you, Jonathan. It's good to be back. Look, we will do his bio, but you know him, you love him, and if you don't know him and you don't love him, then you haven't seen one of our episodes with him or some of his uh, other excellent scholarship that he does a very uh, amazing job of reaching out to the public with. So by the end of the show, you will know him, you will love him. Uh, you know, at the very uh, top of the show, uh, uh, because you do so much, uh, can you tell people where to find you online and tell them about your, your Patreon? Yeah, well, I have a very active Patreon presence for those of you who are interested in deeper learning. Of course, I talk about all things Gnostic. You can find me at patreon.com slash mdavidlitva. And um, yeah, I, I've been putting a lot of stuff up there on the Apocryphon of John. I just signed a contract with Cambridge to put out a new translation with some updated kind of accessibility accessible chapters um i've got a book on the nascenes coming out in late october and uh in accordance with this show i've already submitted a manuscript for a full book on simon and the simonians looking at the contours of that early christian movement so i'm hoping that uh, i can whet your interest and the simon book will be coming out uh from tnt clark so you might already be able to hop on their website and see the sort of pre-publication details. Yeah, that, that's very exciting. I should have introduced you as the very prolific uh, Dr. F. David Lippa. Um, th this is an exciting show for me because we've done, you know, some 200 episodes, yet somehow have never really talked about Simon, which is uh, a huge absence in our programming. Uh, but before we get to him, uh, Simon of Samaria, a.k.a. Simon Magus, a.k.a. Simon Magus, a.k.a. The Great Power, a.k.a. The Standing One, um, can you tell us, uh, like, what what's Samaria and what is a, a Samaritan? Because I think some people are like, those those are the good guys, right? Uh, the, the, a Samaritan is, is a really nice person. He's good. Uh, I, maybe a lot of people aren't, aren't familiar with, uh, with what that term means and uh, a little bit of the history of, of what Samaria is. Well, that's a super important question. And those of you and those of your audience who know me, you will know that I never refer to Simon as Simon Magus. Yeah. And I always refer to him as Simon of Samaria. And I do this quite consciously. And I actually, I argue for this particular position in the book. It's a little bit complex. And the reason being that no one really knows where Gita is. Simon was said to come from a village called Gita. And according to the most recent research, that's not necessarily in Samaria. Mm -hmm. Gita actually, according to Clemens Scholten, who's a German scholar, is really the ancient city of Gath in Idumea. And that's very fascinating because the only other major player we know from Gath is none other than Goliath of Gath. And so this is a very fascinating development. And it really, like with so many other things, we're in this wasteland between history and myth. But it, it is certainly fascinating that the ancient battle between David and Goliath is mirrored or even magnified in the battle between Peter and Simon. And we might, I mean, if we believe Clement Shulton, we might be able to call Simon, Simon of Gath. But he's been called Simon of Gita, and he's been called Simon of Samaria. And the reason why I continue to call him Simon of Samaria is because that's the only place where we can locate him in terms of his active adult life. And this data comes from the author of Acts, who puts him in a quote-unquote city of Samaria, which is almost certainly the major urban area known as Sebasti. And Sebasti is, well, it's named for the Roman emperors, but it's the ancient town of, well, the ancient city called Samaria, part of the ancient northern kingdom. What Simon himself was, we don't know. Just like you can be a 
Christian in Israel, you can be a Jew in Israel, you can be an atheist in Israel. And just because you're in Samaria doesn't mean that you're a Samaritan. There's been a lot of misconceptions here because people very unfortunately, and they've been misled by some scholars, they have assumed that because Simon spent time in Samaria, that he was a Samaritan. Not true. That's a complete non sequitur. In fact, we would be looking for very specific things if we thought that he was a Samaritan. Samaritans have their own special version of Pentateuch. They have their own special script. They have some modifications on the Jewish holidays. But for all intents and purposes, they look very much like Jews, and they perform things that Jews perform. They, by the 4th century, were thought to have a very exalted view of Moses. And they have some interesting you know, history with the Jews. But we have a case here where we have to come face to face with the fact that Simon doesn't show any particular Jewish or Samaritan features. He's never really shown upholding the law, proclaiming himself to be a prophet. He's never really shown, you know, following specifically Samaritan holidays or Samaritan versions of stories in the Pentateuch. So there's nothing distinctly Sumerian about Simon at all. So when I say Simon of Samaria, I do not mean Simon the Samaritan. That would be very different. He was not Samaritan at all. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you're very careful to say Simon of Samaria, but a lot of people watching the show know him as Simon Magus. Can you tell us what what a Magus is or what a Magus was or what that term might have meant to the, the people who gave him that title? Magus is unfortunately a heresiological slur used by Simon's enemies in order to demean and rub his face in the mud. And this is why I refuse to use the term. Now, we can be engaged in something of a post-colonial you know, culture and essentially accept the term for the heresiologists and mimic it and parade it. But I, I choose not to, because I think historically speaking, calling Simon a Magus is just not very helpful. Just like calling Simon a Samaritan just doesn't make a lot of sense. When you look at the term Magus in Greek, Magus has one of two general meanings. Its original meaning was a hereditary Persian priest. And these priests were engaged in very specific activities, including all sorts of minor sacrificial rituals, omens, dream divination. They were involved sometimes in raising the dead, certain kinds of prophecy. And they had a particular relationship with fire and they performed interesting fire rituals. And they're mentioned all over Greek and Roman literature as real players who go back all the way to the days of Cyrus. The other definition, which is about 80%, the other definition of Bagos is quack and charlatan. And um, yeah, this probably is... In fact, it's almost certain that this is how Simon's enemies wished him to be understood. The only other person called Magus in the New Testament is Elimas, the Magus in the book of Acts. And when Paul meets him, Elimas ends up being cruelly blinded and in a sense is completely rejected as a fraud and a charlatan. We have no reason to deny that these associations with Magus were eventually heaped upon Simon by the likes of Justin Martyr and by the likes of Irenaeus, so that eventually Simon Magus became fused and Magus became a sort of last name or surname for Simon, just as Christ became a kind of surname for Jesus 
But I'd like your audience to imagine for a moment a world of difference in which because Simon's followers, some of them anyway, believed that Simon was the Christ, we might call Simon, Simon Christ. And because some opponents of Jesus called him a magus, we might call Jesus, Jesus magus. And what a world that would be if we called Jesus magus and Simon Christ. Obviously today, I think most Christians would have their hackles raised if we started referring to Jesus magus. Although historically, that is what his opponents refer to him as. We just don't do that because we know that that's a value-laden term. Simon, however, scholars are unfortunately very happy to continue to refer to him with a, a slur. And I'm trying to break that, break that trend, you know. I might have socialist tendencies, but I still wouldn't want to be called David the commie. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it's just common sense here, folks. I mean, we, we simply should show signs of respect and neutrality, you know, with whoever we are studying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is, of course, the whole show, but we're going to dig into some things here. But can you give us a brief overview of, of who Simon of Samaria was? You know, do you think he was a historical person, and isn't he in the Bible? Well, he definitely got in the Bible, but um, by hook or crook. I mean, the the book of Acts, I think, is one of the latest books of the Bible, and Irenaeus has to introduce it. It's so unfamiliar. By the year 180, Irenaeus has to introduce it. I'm firmly on the the second century uh, train when it comes to Acts, or at least a, a major. You know, I'll, anyway. Sorry to interrupt, but continue. No, that's fine. I mean, in a sense, Simon is in the Bible in several ways because the way that early Christians conceptualize him, mm -hmm. they really think back to the magicians met by Moses in Pharaoh's court way back in Exodus, and they sort of read. The Moses's competition with Pharaoh's magicians, they project that onto a new screen so that the battle between Simon and Peter in Acts is sort of like a recapitulation of the battle between Moses and the, the Egyptian magicians of old. So he's in the Bible in, in several senses, but the only place that he appears by name is in Acts chapter 8, in which surprisingly, I I brought up Elimas before, surprisingly, Simon looks a lot better than Elimas. And this is very fascinating that the author of Acts is not ready to completely destroy Simon, but he casts many aspersions on his character. Frankly, I don't think we have any strong reason to deny that he existed. But on the other hand, we don't have any strong data to tell us about what he thought. Because if you read the book of Acts, we learn almost nothing about his thought life. And this is very important that for anything like Simon's thoughts, his thought world, the, the mental universe in which he lived, we have to go outside of the canon and talk about other other texts. So my advice to people is, and this is one of the, the misconceptions that I'm trying to overcome in the book, is by focusing on Simon, we have the wrong focus. It's actually the Simonians that should be much more of our focus because the community that we can document, the community that we know something about is actually Simon's followers. It isn't Simon himself. And the Simonian thought, this is what appears later in texts like the Great Declaration and in the Heresy Reports. By the time we get to these documents, the memory of Simon has faded or been twisted or reimagined, much like the memory of Jesus. And so basically, it's a, one of those questions where it almost doesn't matter. And the, the the question, did Simon exist or did Jesus exist? Well, 
I mean, for my money, that question is really not too relevant because what we're talking about is early Christian memory. And that is more significant than flesh and bones. It's more significant than, you know, going back in a time machine and seeing who these people really were. They are who they were remembered to be. And that's what we have to be concerned with. Can you tell us a bit about your upcoming book? Like, you know, what what it has to say about Simon and the Simonians, its focus, and, and what really moved you to, to write it? So I wish I could show you my PowerPoint. Um, as we discovered earlier in this episode, my laptop audio wasn't working for whatever reason. But I had a PowerPoint in which I, I went through the chapters systematically. The... The claim to fame for my book is that I try to be comprehensive. I try to hit every possible source between the early 2nd and the 4th century. I don't think we have any 1st century sources for Simon, so I'm um, sorry about that. But I, I, I talk about Simon in the Great Declaration, which is, the, the I think, the only really Simonian source that we have. We'll say a little bit more about that. I talk about Simon in the Nagamati text called The Concept of Our Great Power, which uses distinctly Simonian terms and ideas and applies them to a new apocalyptic context. I talk then, of course, about Simon in Acts. I talk about Simon in the Epistle of the Apostles and in 3 Corinthians. Then I go to Justin, Irenaeus, the Refutator. I talk about Simon in Eusebius in Origen and Epiphanius in Philaster. Those are the heresiologists. And then finally, I talk about Simon in, Gre in Christian novels, starting with the Acts of Peter and then the Pseudo-Clementine homilies. So I try to cover absolutely everything we have from about 125 to about 325. And that's really the claim to fame for this book, that you're, you're going to get everything and you're going to get every perspective and you're quickly going to realize that there never was and there never will be one Simon just like there never was and will be one Jesus there is a series of portraits that melt into each other a collage as it were some sort of kaleidoscopic thing that gets morphed and melded in our minds but we have to pay attention to the differences because each particular portrait has its own colors and contours, textures, and they're not the same. And I try to bring that out in the book. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Great Declaration. Can you, can you tell us what that is? And I mean, you kind of already answered this question, but you know, you can answer it again or clarify it. Did you think any of the theology in the, uh, the text could be traced back to the historical Simon? I don't, because there's no bridge to the historical Simon, and I know that might greatly disappoint some in your audience, but when a scholar is ignorant, we have to say that we're ignorant, and I can't stand up here and say that I'm going to give you access to the historical Simon. I mean, if we haven't already realized that getting access to the historical Simon wouldn't really help us much, we probably have to just continue doing more research because, you know, we're going to find someday how to build a time machine and we're going to find the historical Jesus and the historical Simon and we're going to be deeply disappointed, let me tell you. What's interested, what, or what's interesting is who these people became in the great, in, in the great, machine of the human imagination in in the 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 pool of creativity and you know memory that is remembered and rehashed and crossed again and added to and modified in a thousand different ways that's the picture with color the historical jesus and the historical simon is a, is like a pixelated grayscale image which is always receding going through, you know, like sand through the fingers. Where we need to begin, and this is something that I can't emphasize enough to your viewers, 
and is the paradigm change that I'm trying to introduce. When we're doing real history on Simon and the Simonians, we do not begin with novels. Now, I know that many of your readers, or many of your audience, I should say, really love novels, and I love novels too, but I don't start writing history from Christian fiction. So unlike many others, and many others who are unfortunately deeply misinformed and are spreading horrible misconceptions on the internet, I do not begin with the pseudo-Clementines. Uh, this is not where anyone should begin. That's the latest. You may think it's the greatest picture of Simon, but it's the latest and it's the most composite, shifting, and inconsistent portrait of Simon. It is the ultimate fiction. And I think this is really important, that if we're really serious about doing history, about recovering the thought of, of people, people who were just like us, Simonians, We've got to start with their thought and their sources. And that's why I begin with the Apophasis Megali, otherwise known as the Great Declaration. And the only way, the only source we have for that is a single manuscript witness that contains this text. And that manuscript is the, the Refutation of All Heresies, written by an anonymous writer in Rome who had what no one else had, which is an actual Simonian source written in Simon's own voice. So you can see why people would be confused, right? It's sort of like the Gospel of John. Whoever the author of the Gospel of John was, he, he wrote monologues and put them in the mouth of Jesus. Same thing with the Gospel of Thomas and so on. You know, it's all about Jesus said. Well, in the Great Declaration, it's all about what Simon says. And so, yes, obviously, it's a great temptation to say, well, you know, the, this speech, you know, is a sort of goes back to Simon, just like Jesus's long monologues in the Gospel of John go back to Jesus. Well, they actually don't. They're, they're the latest uh, inventions of the apostolic writers or those posing as apostles. That doesn't mean that they are any worse. In fact, the the depth, the spiritual depth of John, you know, who is the apostolic eagle, rises so far above the other synoptics. He has transformed the memory of Jesus. I mean, if if I was, you know, wanting pure history to understand the historical Jesus, I would be upset. But if I'm interested in a, a spiritual vision, then... I'm not upset at all. I mean, <laughs> it's the same thing with Simobian. So Simon speaks with the voice of great authority in, in the Great Declaration. And what we find there is a Simon who is very much in tune with Greco-Roman philosophy. I'd like to think that the historical Simon was as well. I just don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not denying anything. and I'm not affirming anything about the historical Simon. If that interests you, go to town. But what we have in the Great Declaration is an author posing as Simon who knows a great deal about Greco-Roman philosophy, Greco-Roman religion, who is Stoic and Platonic and Aristotelian, and he can quote Homer, and he can, you know, I mean, he's, he's a wonderful polymath. And on my Patreon, you'll see my own reading of the Great Declaration, well, you'll be able to get the whole book, The Refutation of All Heresies, on my Patreon. Um, but I, I also have the specifically the Great Declaration in there, and I've got a reading of the Great Declaration as well, which is sort of like a contemplative reading with lots of pictures and fun stuff like that. So, um, I mean, admittedly, I, 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 if, if you don't already know, I'm a complete amateur when it comes to technology, but you know, I, I do my best. And uh, you know, this is one of those meditative spiritual masterpieces. So in a sense, I'm just reading the text and showing you some nice pictures. So forget about me and hear Simon, because it's a profound, profound text. 
and unfortunately ignored. You know, as much as I love Nagamati, when we got Nagamati, we forgot about the stuff we already had, you know. <laughs> so, and what we have is this wonderful text in the original Greek. And of course, I've translated it in my full translation of the refutation of all heresies. And in in the um in 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 the in the new book that's coming out, I've got a revised translation where I, I've tweaked and improved it a bit. So yeah. I'll whet your appetite. Well, can you kind of break down some of the the theology for us, which I which I know can get kind of dense. And of course, hey everybody, go to his Patreon, buy the new book because then you can catch some of the the poetry of the text that uh, that the Litva is talking about instead of just straight information that we're going to give you now. But, you know, can you talk about creation, the seven powers, the nature of God, the nature of man, what a bunch of standing around has to do with the Trinity, how man could be deified? So some of these major points that are that are within this text. That's a tall order, Jonathan. I, I think. Um, yeah, it's hard to put this thing in, in a nutshell. It, it really is. It really is something to be experienced rather than something to be creedalized. But um let me see. We begin with the great power. And, well, I should say we begin with silence. That's that's really where the text begins. The text begins with silence. We only find this out at the end. But there's pure and, and utter silence. And then there's fire that fills the cosmos, and that is representative of mind. And then there is a manifestation of mind, and that is what this author calls the, the seventh power. Now, the reason he gets the seventh power is because what the Great Declaration is, it's our first known Christian hexameron. If any of you know that term, a hexameron is a commentary on the on the six or seven days, depending on the author, of creation. So what the author of the Great Declaration does is he goes through and he tells you what the six days represent. And he's got a, his own mystical, allegorical reading. He tells you what he thinks God is. He tells you what he thinks the spirit over the waters is. And he goes through the six days. And then you get to the seventh power. And the seventh power, interestingly, is never called wisdom, but she is the female creatrix figure. And she, her other name, which you'll know probably better, you're more familiar with it, her other name is Pinia or Thought. Now, this is a very interesting trait of the Great Declaration, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it's utterly important and unique is in traditional Simonian theology known from the heresiologists, we have Simon and Helen representing mind and, and thought. And there's no Simon and there's no Helen actually as players in the Great Declaration. Simon is only the speaker, and he never says that he's anyone or anything. But what seems to have been the case is you had mind and thought. And these were principles of reality. And it's really thought, or opinia as she's called, uh, in the Great Declaration, that is the major, the major player. And in my view, each mind and thought they are um, both together manifestations of a certain power, or a thought specifically is, I should say. Thought has three manifestations, or three phases of existence. She is the one who stood in eternity past, who stands and who will stand. And that implicitly is a kind of Trinitarianism. And it's one of the earliest forms of Trinitarianism, by the way. I mean, in the early second century, when I think that this text was written, people weren't talking about the Trinity. They didn't even have that language. 
And so when we read the Great Declaration as an early second century text, you know, we're not expecting to see any real Trinitarian language. And we don't. What we see is God in three phases, the one who was, is, and is to come, which is the more familiar language. But the author uses the language of standing. So it's not that and, and it's not it's not that there's only one phase of standing, right? So it's that there's three phases of standing. It's it's the one who stood, stands, and will stand. And that's really interesting. Later on, Simon will come to be called the standing one. But that's interestingly very late. You know, we don't have that as a documented name for Simon until the, the third century. And then when you get into Christian novels, they run with that. But it's incredibly late and so not very relevant for my purposes. What's really relevant is this this being who stood, stands, and will stand. And that is Apenia, that is thought. She is the creatrix. And the phase of existence, the way she goes from being the one who stands to the one who will stand, is by helping us human beings realize our identity with God. And we're part of her. You know, our thoughts collectively make up her thought. And she's trying to redeem herself through our intelligence. And unfortunately, as things are going, we've got a long way to go. Absolutely. Um why did Simon's critics criticize Simon's self-deification? And, um, of course, when I say Simon's critics and Simon there, you, you can just take it for granted. I mean, the, the Simon of myth that we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, that you explained at the beginning of the show. Why was, why was the self-deification in the Simonian material uh, criticized by the, the early heresiologists? Like, why, why did they think that was bad? Well, this is one of the misleading things about heresiology and you know you got to be a really good reader of, of heresiology you you can't you can't ever reject it but you've got to read it really really well interestingly enough the first person to say that simon deified himself was justin martyr and then this kind of became traditional because if you, if you look back in acts what we have is a situation where a bunch of people around simon are calling him the great power. But Simon never says anything about himself. And this is really important that it's an unfortunate fact of heresiology that there that even good readers of Acts, they're like reinscribing the heresiology because we know in the back of our heads that the heresiologists are all saying, Simon makes himself a god, and then we go and read Acts, and we're like, yep, that's what he did. But actually, he never says anything about himself. And this is really important, very important. There's no evidence of Simon's self deification And when you, look at the, when you look at the refutation, the author of the, of the refutation, whom I call the refutator, he says that Simon deified himself. But then when you look at the Great Declaration, there's not a shred of evidence for that. Not a shred. I mean, at most, this author is deifying everybody, not himself specifically. I mean, if we are all thoughts, if, if all of our thoughts and our collective consciousness and our and you know intelligence is the the process of the the divine feminine trying to realize herself in the world, that could be, you know, deification. Um, but it's not a deification specifically of Simon, it's of all of us. And yeah, we, I mean, we are, we're, we're helping wisdom and wisdom is helping us. And at the end of all this, we will realize our own eternity. We will stand with wisdom and, you know, we will think the eternal thought and, you know, I, I'm happy to call that a deification, but it's not as not what the heresiologists make it out to be. You know, the heresiologists are very bad readers, you know, because they want to say that Simon is 
self-glorifying. Actually, what we can see what he's doing is really like, much like a, a spiritual leader today. He's, he's trying to convince everybody else that they are divine. And he doesn't say anything about himself. I mean, hardly anything. Um, I, mean, I mean, he doesn't give himself titles. He doesn't give himself airs. He's not concerned about any of that. That's quite striking. So sometimes when you, you look up uh, Simon of Samaria, you, you come across information about evil angels that are mucking up the cosmos and imprisoning humans. Uh, what's, what's that all about? I, I, I was going to give a, a kind of a cheeky answer. Um, it, it's about nothing, really. I mean, there's just no evidence of it. There's just not a shred of evidence in it in, in the Great Declaration itself. The, the very first person to say that is Irenaeus. And yeah, in one sense, the creation by angels is utterly banal. You know, because in a sense, lots of people believe that. There's nothing distinctive about that. Even by those that. Yeah, it's pretty you know, common in, in Second Temple thought, right? There's this idea of creation by angels. Of course, because they all they all think that, you know, the father doesn't get his hands dirty, and they're probably right. So you've got to have somebody doing the dirty work, playing the role of the young gods in the Timaeus. So it's an utterly banal doctrine, you know. It's something that's common and widespread and not distinctive to anybody. And eventually it becomes you know, by the late second century, a kind of recycled heresiological slur against a whole variety of groups. But we just don't know what they believed. You know, they said the same thing about Carpocrates, but we don't know. <laughs> I mean, when you go and you read the only source for Carpocrates we have, which is his son Epiphanes, he never mentions it. And he simply refers to God as the creator the only creator we find in Simonian, in the in the Simonian source that we have, is wisdom, she, or the seventh power. She's the creatrix. Not a single angel is mentioned. So, but he mentions uh, when talking about the 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 seventh power when you were talking about uh, uh, the Great Declaration, uh, Helen. Like, uh, who was Helen, or who was she thought to be? You know, what role did she play in the later, later heresiological reports of, of Simon and his thought? Well, Helen is very important, but she's not in the Great Declaration, interestingly. Um, this is the, the puzzling and, and riddling fact. Helen becomes, in Justin Martyr, the incarnation of wisdom. And you know, we have no reason to deny that. But what's interesting is in our earliest Simonian source, Simon and Helen don't really play uh, any significant role at all. So it's tough to imagine what was going on in the early period. In the early period, probably, Simonians, like many Christians, believed in wisdom as creatrix. In fact, that, that's exactly what we read in Proverbs 8 and the Wisdom of Solomon, Chapter 7. Wisdom is the creatrix. She is the feminine divine. It's a standard, common Jewish teaching that is adopted by Christians. The Simonian modification on that teaching by the mid-2nd century is that wisdom was incarnate. The feminine divine entered a female body. And I think this is so important for, for Christians to understand today because in modern Christian orthodoxy, God only enters a male body. And this has caused all sorts of problems. Um, you know, it's it's one of those reasons that, you know, or one of those causes, I guess, for conservative, you know, Roman Catholic and Orthodox theologians to say that, you know, women shouldn't be priests. I mean, there is something profoundly unfair about, you know, God becomes incarnate in a male, but not in a female. 
And in the great laboratory of Christianities, Simonianism is the only form of Christianity which says that the divine feminine becomes fully incarnate in a woman. And that's Helen. And Helen has an interesting story. But if Helen is the seventh power, then she basically plays the role of wisdom who gets trapped here, basically. It's um, it's very much like the the myth we see in in the book of Enoch, chapter 42, where wisdom descends to human beings and like justice in Greek mythology, she just can't stand it. So she, she just goes back up where she came. You know, she just cannot put up with people. And the modification of that is that wisdom comes down to earth in Simonian theology and she gets stuck here. She can't go back. And she can't die either. So she get she lives through life through various lives and she keeps getting reincarnated. One of the larger questions of Simonianism is, you know, do they think everybody gets reincarnated? Because they don't explicitly say that, but they only say that wisdom keeps getting reincarnated and she keeps getting more and more abused as time goes forward. You know, men take advantage of her and rape her and steal her. And so she is the Helen in the Trojan War. Which is interesting because Helen of Sparta was worshipped as a goddess in Sparta and in other places. She was also the most beautiful woman in the world. You know, that's the divine beauty shining out of her. And the Greeks thought that she had powers so she could blind Stesichorus, the poet, for saying nasty things about her. But eventually she you know, undergoes the ultimate degradation and finds herself so abused and raped and enslaved that she ends up in a brothel. And it's from there where you think wisdom is, is completely lost and the creatrix is, you know, has become utterly, wisdom has become utterly foolish and the creatrix utterly powerless that Simon, the divine mind, the incarnate mind, comes in and redeems her. And essentially, it's this whole process of getting wisdom to remember who she is that is the process which Simonians are, are all part of. And the point of living and the point of reality is to make wisdom wisdom again. You know, Paul spoke of a foolish wisdom which is probably the origin of all of this, right? How can wisdom be foolish? Well, she's foolish insofar as she gets stuck here and like everybody else, begins to forget who she really is. Um, th this is a, a whole can of worms, but deification followers of John the Baptist following a new teacher, miracles proving divinity, Samaria, prominent female com companion, the Paraclete. But can you talk about the relationship between the Gospel of John, the Joannites, and the Simonians, or a possible relationship? Or Because some scholars like to pull on threads there. Yeah, they pull on threads mostly because they are starting with pseudo-Pementines. Um, which is what I've told everybody you shouldn't do. But um, it's important to understand why scholars do that. If we go back to the 19th century, we see that F.C. Bauer sort of had this really bizarre theory when you think of it, that he used the fourth century novel, the Pseudo-Clementines, to argue that there were essentially two camps in Christianity, the Petrine party and a Paul party. And, you know, a law party and a law-free party. I like a Jewish Christian party and a Gentile Christian party. And when when F.C. Bauer read the Pseudo-Clementines, he took this as evidence of 
particular kind of Christianity that Simon represented the Pauline wing and that he was a stand-in for, for Paul. And ever since then, scholars have been realizing just how wrong F. D. Bauer was about just about this entire theory. I mean, there's not really a shred <laughs> of evidence. I mean, you'll see, unfortunately, there are probably thousands of videos of Bob Price telling, you know, the internet world that Simon and the pseudo Clementines is a stand-in for Paul. But good scholars don't really believe this anymore. Now, that's not to say that there aren't elements of Paul that do get wrapped into the Simon of the pseudo Clementines, right? I should say they remembered Paul. You know, the Paul remembered as, you know, the law free, you know, uh, sometimes critic of, of Judaism. That's the Paul that gets remembered in Simon. But Simon and the pseudo Clementines is so many other things. You know, he's, for the first time, we see him as a magus. You know, that's that's where, you know, he actually does the activities of the magus. Whereas before, before the pseudo Clementines, we never saw him perform any quote unquote magical activity. But in the pseudo Clementines, oh my goodness, you know, all of a sudden we, he pulls out his, you know, bag of magic tricks and, you know, the rest is history. Um, you know, Simon in the in, in the pseudo Clementines is also Elimas. He's also he's basically every enemy of Orthodox Christianity wrapped into one. Right. So it, it's extremely reductive just to say that he's standing in for Paul. No, he's not. He, it's so much more complex than that. And I think what's what I would say to people is you know, when you read my book, there's a reason why I put the pseudo Clementines as the last chapter. If you love the pseudo Clementines, that's great. So do I. But save it for last. Okay. Don't start with the conceptions of the pseudo Clementines because the pseudo Clementines are going to try to convince you, you know, they're going to create a fictional history in which Simon was a follower of John the Baptist. He went to Egypt to learn magic. Um, <laughs> He killed Dosithius in order to get, you know, the special position of power among the 30 standing ones. Helen was a woman actually called Luna. All that stuff is, you know, the complete tissue of, of, of fictions. And, you know, there's a strong impulse among scholars to say, well, you know, why don't we make the novel into history? Why don't we... Why don't we read the fictions as facts and then, you know, see where that goes? But why would we? You know, wh why would we? It's it's sort of like trying to learn about Jesus. You know, let's say that you know nothing about Jesus and, and you're only and, and, and you wanted to learn about the historical Jesus. And you you started with Jesus Christ Superstar. Right. <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> I mean. I mean, surely there would be other sources where you would want to go first, right? But it's like, oh, no, I'm going to start with Jesus Christ Superstar, and then I'm going to read everything else to fit some of the clues in Jesus Christ Superstar, you know? So in the end, no matter what happens, you know, no matter how many sources I read, I'm still going to believe that Jesus was a hippie or, or something. I, I don't know. I mean, I actually don't know much about Jesus Christ Superstar. But my, my point is this, that you don't start with a novel. Yeah. And there's no reason to think that there's a shred of history. Remember that all almost all of these documents are designed to destroy Simon, right? Yes. So when you so it's a kind of ironic fact that people who are genuinely and truly interested in Simon take some of these, you know, essentially nasty uh, uh, caricatures. And they want to make them into historical facts because they're interesting, you know, and novels are interesting, you know, but please don't start there. Read the book. Yeah. There's much more before the pseudo Clementines. You'll, you'll find something interesting. I guarantee it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we can't say again, the people go out and get the book. Well, I think we're almost uh, ready to wrap up. Uh, the t time is ticking, but uh, an important question to sort of end on, which is, were the Simonians Christians? 
Well, who thinks they weren't? I mean, it, it's only people like um, who start with certain presuppositions about Simon that say he wasn't a Christian. Everybody in the ancient world thinks he's a Christian. I mean, let's be honest. You wouldn't end up in a heresy catalog if they didn't think that you were Christian. I mean, they don't, you know, Irenaeus isn't biting his nails about, you know, the uh, the Druids, you know. Um, if Simon was really a Persian priest who had nothing to do with Christianity and wrote a theology, you know, that had nothing to do with Christian theology, Irenaeus would have let him go, you know? It's only because he knows, and this is so important, it's only because he knows that the Simonians are Christians that he wakes up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, you know? I mean, he just can't let this happen. So the assumption is always and everywhere that Simonians are Christians. Simonians say that they're Christians, and later, by the late second century, Simonians are saying that Simon is Christ. You can imagine, you know, what terror that strikes, you know, in, in the hearts of, uh, you know, heresiologists. So they are definitely Christians. They definitely believe in Jesus. They just believe that Jesus is an incarnation of Simon, or, or I should say, rather, both Simon and Jesus are incarnations of the greater mind, and that Simon gave the higher revelation in, in Samaria, where Jesus gave the lower revelation in Galilee and Judea. So they have no problem talking about Jesus, and they love Jesus. They identify Simon and Jesus. Of course they're Christian. I think one of the misleading things about people who read the Great Declaration is, is we've been told for so long that you know there's nothing Christian in the Great Declaration. But, you know, there's nothing Orthodox Christian, you know, but, but, and we all have these frameworks in our minds, you know, like, well, if they're not going to mention Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then it's not the true Christian Trinity. And we just can't imagine a world in which in the early second century, Christians were talking about the one who stood, stands, and will stand as an equally valid way of talking about the Trinity. You know, it's the way it, it's the way less traveled, okay? <laughs> but not the way any less important. And, you know, if history took a different turn, we might all be talking about the one who stood, stands, and will stand, rather than Father, Son, and Holy, and Holy Spirit. I mean, the fact is, by the late second century, the Simonians were also talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they could adapt to the language, of course. But the point is that the language changed over time, and the nature of Christian truth and metaphysics changed over time. So let them define what Christianity is for them. And we just do our jobs as learning from them rather than judging them which is an unfortunate, you know, after effect of, of some scholarship, we start saying, oh, well, you know, these aren't Christians. You know, if we do the same thing with the Manichaeans, you know, <laughs> incidentally. You know, like the weirdness coefficient of some of these writings is so high that it's like, oh, that can't be Christian because we're all, of course, coming in with the framework of what is and isn't Christian. Sorry, sorry. And yeah, so yes, absolutely, absolutely, this is Christian. That's the presupposition <laughs> of the whole book. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, the book again. Uh, what's the publisher? So the publisher is TNT Clark. Um, it's it's the same publisher I published Found Christianities with. And so, if you've read Found Christianities, you'll see that I have a, a short chapter on Simon in that book. And this is the the great and amazing expansion of of that and the the full book length treatment. Simon in terms of monographs on Simon, the last one we had was like in two thousand three. Okay. So after twenty years we can we can use some updating.
And, you know, the scholars spent way too much time and exhausted all their energy on determining whether Simon was a Gnostic. Yeah. And, you know, there are other questions that are equally important. Yeah. So check it out. Yeah, it sounds like an awesome book. Sounds like an important book. Everybody go out and buy a copy. If you can't buy a copy for some reason, uh, request it to your local library. Buy it. Uh, people forget that you can do that. Uh, all libraries, they have a, a usually on their website where you can put in that request. Go to patreon.com slash mdavidlitva to, uh, to get all of his uh, great content, but more Simon material there. As he said, his meditation on the, the Great Decla Declaration is there, so make sure you read that. Uh, experience that, you know, it's, it's a lot better. Uh, it, you'll be able to catch the poetry of it. Uh, uh, Patreon.com slash Gnostic to help us out to keep the show going. You can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Thanks again so much, Dr. Liva. It was uh, really awesome. And yeah, this this sounds like a, a very important book. And I'm glad I'm glad you're shifting shifting some paradigms. Glad, glad you're pushing those paradigms down the road. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank your audience you know, this kind of support that we get, you know, many of us are just small communities and, you know, Talknosis is, is a great show. You know, it's not anything about flashy fireworks and clickbait and it supports scholars who can really use the help actually, you know, and who are really trying to do their best in this world so i want to thank you and uh as as an audience and jonathan and um yeah it's a great pleasure to be on and we will hopefully do this again sometime i suspect we will well, you have two more books coming out and uh, i'm eager to both read them and talk about them and uh because you're so prolific i imagine that we'll have stuff to talk about uh, for years to come so uh thanks again and bye everybody